In the last lecture, we left off talking about afterload, which is the mean pressure or the average amount of pressure that is present in the aorta, right? And what that ultimately will um, tell us is blood pressure in the arteries. So what we're gonna do now is talk about arterial blood pressure, then talk about ways that blood pressure can be re regulated and changed and altered and the effectors of blood pressure. So here we go. So normally blood pressure is expressed as our systolic over our diastolic. Normal blood pressure, 120 over 80, that's in millimeters of mercury. Right. This relates to systole and diastole of the heart. So systolic pressure, blood pressure is generated as blood is ejected from the heart during ventricular contraction, whereas diastolic blood pressure is the pressure in the arteries during ventricular relaxation. We can do pulse pressure as another way of looking at it, which is just systolic minus diastolic. equals pulse pressure, or another one that is probably most commonly used is mean arterial pressure, often abbreviated MAP or MAP. So it's important because it is ultimately gonna determine the rate of flow throughout the systemic circuit, right? This tells us the average pressure. So as we talked about in the afterload situation, as if average pressure goes up, then blood flow goes down. If average pressure, in this case, in the arteries goes down, then flow goes up, right? So, um, however, it's not super easy to determine. Um, while we can do it, um, it's not a simple average of systolic and diastolic pressure as you might think of average, which would just be add the two together and divide by two. Instead, what we have to go back to is that length of the cardiac cycle so that we know that um, we can take the diastolic blood pressure, add it to about one-third, which is the um, normal time spent in systolic blood pressure, times the pulse pressure or systolic minus diastolic. I'll note that this is only good at rest. This equation is completely invalid at uh, exercise because this constant value is no longer there uh, is no longer the same value because of the much less time spent in both systole and diastole. So note this equation only at rest. So how do we regulate blood pressure and how do we measure it? So we're going to be back to this figure. This is the stuff I photoshopped out. It's, it's back in now. Uh, but what, what we have the ability to do is we have mechanosensors known as baroreceptors. And we have them uh, in two places one in the aorta here, and one in the carotid artery in your neck. What these are are mechanoreceptors that sense pressure changes. They're found, like I said, in the aorta and carotid. If arterial blood pressure increases, the baroreceptors in one of these two areas will then send sensory information, you can see, so that means their afferent nerves will then be sent to our cardiovascular control center in the medulla oblongata. What we can then do is respond with some type of response. So in this case, increased blood pressure, then we would want to get back to homeostasis. We would increase parasympathetic tone to the heart. In this case, we could decrease heart rate and cardiac output, which would be main effectors of uh, blood pressure to help lower blood pressure. That's just an acute sense. Of course, that's not always how it works in health and disease, but to give you an idea that we have these mechanosensors that talk to our brain that we then have the ability to um, then alter the, uh, the blood pressure. And as mentioned here, one of the key ways we do it is by altering cardiac output, which comes into our next slide perfectly. So here are all the effectors of cardiac output or of blood pressure. Sorry, we can um, talk about uh, some of them. So first is our cardiac output, is our heart rate, or our stroke volume. So a change in either of these, again, will change the amount of blood going through the system. The easiest way to think about these are water hose examples, right? So this is like turning the water faucet higher or lower at the, at the water faucet. If you turn it up, AKA you increase stroke volume, um, then you 
would of course increase the pressure in that water hose increasing blood pressure. So I think that's one that makes sense and as we talked about an easy one. We also have um, other different ways uh, to, to look at them. The first thing that we're going to talk about are what we're going to talk about at the end of this lecture is blood volume and viscosity. So if we have any changes in hemodynamics, that will affect what we're going to spend our time on now is the uh, peripheral resistance. What we mean by peripheral resistance is usually called the total peripheral vascular resistance. And what that is, is that is the uh, resistance found in all of the major arteries and arterioles in the body. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about the relationship among pressure, resistance, and flow, and then we'll talk about how this gets uh, uh, makes sense as far as generating blood pressure for the whole body. So if we look at blood flow ultimately can be determined by two things. One, an increase in blood pressure or an increase in blood flow. And in general, blood flow is equal to um, a, uh, the change in pressure over the system. So if you think about the cardiac system, right, we have a really high, uh, flow, high pressure at the beginning. 120 millimeters of mercury. At the end of the flow, we actually have the veins, right? And they have actually very little pressure in them. So it's almost 120 to zero. So our change in pressure is huge. Therefore, the main thing that we're gonna do to alter um, blood pressure is not really have any effect on pressure. We already have a large gap there, but instead to alter resistance, right? Um, so resistance is an interesting one. It has a complex formula. Don't worry, you don't need to memorize this formula. Uh, I just showed here so that you can see it. It's proportional to the length of the vessel and the viscosity of the blood, or viscosity of the fluid divided by the radius raised to the fourth power. A couple notes. Length and viscosity don't really change in normal physiology, right? Our arteries aren't getting any longer in our body, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, and for the most part, our blood viscosity stays about the same, right? Uh, we can talk a little bit about viscosity changes in hemodynamics later, but for the most part, normal healthy physiology at rest in homeostasis, both of these are constants. So therefore, the way that we regulate blood pressure through all of this, and or sorry, blood flow through all of this is by altering vasoconstriction or vasodilating. Constricting means making the, the size of the vessel or the radius of the vessel smaller, whereas um, vasodilation is making the uh, radius of the vessel much larger. So one thing that I want to point out that's really important is that small, small changes in the, di the diameter or the radius of these vessels um, makes a huge difference, right? So everything is raised to the fourth power, right? So that means tiny, tiny changes will have a huge effect on resistance, right? So as we go through the body, where are we actually regulating all of the resistance? So the sources of vascular resistance or total peripheral vascular resistance um, can be seen here in this chart. So when we talked about the makeup of the cardiovascular system, of course, we have our heart pump, left ventricles. We then have our large arteries. Next is our arterioles. We didn't talk about this, so we don't have to worry about that. Then we have our capillaries, which is where uh, exchange of nutrients, oxygen, uh, and carbon dioxide takes place. Then we have our return system, our venules, which then give uh, into larger veins. Right. So as you can see with this nice spike, what we're looking at here is each time we see a spike, that is a heartbeat. So you can see as the left ventricle generates a large amount of pressure, we then uh, have systole, then diastole, systole, diastole, systole. You'll see the large arteries in, uh, they have an average pressure. So you'll notice that our blood pressure here is 120 over 80, which is just what we see in normal. So in general, our large arteries aren't actually controlling the major resistance of, of skeletal muscle. Instead, what you see is once blood flow gets into the arterioles, these are our predominant regulators of uh, uh, total peripheral or vascular resistance. 
So we're going to alter these arterioles really well so that we can change um, um, change total resistance in the body, right? So this large drop, 70 to 80% occurs in these arterioles. And so this is where total peripheral vascular resistance is ultimately going to be changed by altering the contraction and vasodilation of these arterioles. What we're really doing is being able to open more up, right? And as we'll get into blood flow changes with exercise, uh, for example, we can open and close uh, some of these arterioles. If we open a whole bunch of them, then that will, of course, decrease total peripheral vascular resistance because you will have more vessels uh, open. And so that becomes important. The veins and venules, very, very little. Again, we'll see the total pressure in the system, 120 over 80, with most of that drop happening in our resistance vessels. So the last thing that we'll come back to is blood volume and blood viscosity. So, so if we look at the physical characteristics of blood when we start talking about viscosity, um, uh, what we're really talking about uh, with that is how thick the blood is and how many proteins is found in that. And when we mean proteins, what we really mean it is red blood cells. So first what we do is when we take a blood sample, we then in general put it into a centrifuge, we spin it down, we get a liquid portion and a much more solid thick portion. That liquid portion is what we consider plasma. It contains ions, proteins, and hormones. And then the thick part is what we consider the hematocrit. Normal hematocrit is about 42%. And that is, um, that can go up or down, right? So what that will do is ultimately make it thicker, right? So hematocrit is uh, realistically the amount of uh, blood cells uh, in the body. And so what are red blood cells? Well, they contain hemoglobin, which is responsible for carrying oxygen. There's also some white blood cells and platelets uh, that are, can be found in here. But for the most part, when we think about how this re relates to blood pressure is we're talking about hematocrit. So this is the percentage of the blood that's composed of cells. As you can think about, the cells actually have a thickness to them, right? So the more hematocrit you have, the thicker your blood is, and it can become more like a motor oil, or if you lose them, it becomes more like a water. Obviously, those are two, you know, very opposite ends of the spectrum, and our blood really doesn't get as thick as motor oil or as thin as water, um, but it gives you an idea of the importance. As well as an exercise performance, this is actually going to be carrying oxygen to our cells. So if you ever wonder what blood doping is really trying to do, what they're doing is trying to increase hematocrit levels so they have more oxygen carrying capacity. And as I mentioned, it's very rare for uh, any of these systems to really change. Most people's blood hovers right around this exact same function here. Uh, um, and so we don't have to worry about it too much. However, there are some diseases and disorders that can affect this. Um, and so I won't spend any time on them, but just wanted you to know, get an idea of what plasma is and what hematocrit is and how the blood is made up, knowing that at steady state, normal homeostasis, we don't have to worry about it. So that'll finish up the lecture today.